Hey everyone, Richard from Digital Foundry here and today we're going to be talking about potential 4K screen upgrades to match your brand new Xbox One X. And uh, joining me to discuss the possible screens that we consider worthy of purchase, David Beaton. Hey Rich. How's it going? Yeah, not bad. Okay, so let's begin at the best midpoint between price versus performance, uh, the mid-range screen. What are we looking at there? What options right. are available? Okay, so uh, at the top of the list is the Sony XE90 this year. So uh, the reason why this sort of caught my eye compared to the other competing mid-range screens from say Samsung and Panasonic is due to the sort of backlight features. So it's got, well actually it's the only mid-range screen that has full array local dimming. So to put things into perspective, most LCDs use edge lighting like our Panasonic here, which means the LEDs are normally located at the bottom or the top. And what that means, if you have like a, a dark scene with a bright object, the only thing that the TV can do is either dim the entire screen or individual vertical columns. So you're gonna have areas of sort of dark imagery that get brighter when you don't want them to. Whereas on the XE90, because the screen is divided up into sort of individual squares or zones, uh, I think it has 48 zones on the XE90, it means you could have a bright object and some dark scenery coexist without as much interference. So you're kind of getting more of that dynamic range on screen at the same time, rather than just some highlights and some dark details sort of independently. So with our Panasonic here, I mean, last year, originally we recommended this Panasonic as the best mid-range screen. Samsung's firmware wasn't quite up to it. Then they did actually upgrade their firmware, KS7000, KS8000, those were our picks. But this year we're going for Sony and it is yep. because of those individual uh, zones, individual yep, dimming right. zones. Okay, and uh, yeah, I've noticed actually on the Panasonic that you know you can actually see the columns of different illumination in an HDR scene. It's not quite ideal. Exactly, and the, the Sony implementation is uh, quite subtle. So Sony's algorithm tends to favour reducing the blooming rather than trying to make the blacks as black as possible with the dimming. It tries to strike a balance so that you get minimal artifacts. But on top of the actual local dimming, the Sony has other benefits as well. So peak brightness is about 900 nits, so it's close to that 1000 nit mark you'd want. It has a wider color gamut, not as wide as this year's sort of Samsung's, but it's still a lot wider than Rec. 709, what you get with um, SDR, sort of standard dynamic range content. Mm -hmm. uh, and input lag comes in at a pretty decent 32 milliseconds. So even though it's not the fastest, it's still sort of responsive and quite snappy. Mm -hmm. So it's a good all-round uh, set in that respect. But Samsung do have a decent enough alternative, right? What is the model there? Yes, it's the uh, Q7F. Right. So this is basically Samsung's uh, QLED range. Uh, that's what they're calling it. But basically it's an edge-lit LED TV that uses quantum dots to increase the peak brightness and the uh, color gamut, make that wider. So uh, originally I wasn't going to recommend it, but it's had a price drop to make it more competitive with the other mid-range screens. So the advantage of the uh, Samsung is that the color accuracy is better than the Sony. You have controls to dial it in to get it authentic. And it also has a lower input lag of around 24 milliseconds. Okay, so that's an eight millisecond advantage there. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. I don't think you'd necessarily notice, but you know, if, if you're aiming for the lowest level of input lag and you want more accurate sort of colors in HDR, uh, I guess that's a, a good alternative. In terms of downsides, it is edge lit and it works on the vertical column basis. So you're not getting as accurate HDR presentation as on the Sony. The highlights are brighter. So you're kind of you know, compromising for some aspects of picture quality in terms of others. Okay, so it's got lower latency, better color gamut, but the HDR not quite as good as the Sony. Is that the bottom line? Yeah, it's brighter, but not as accurate. So. Having looked at the mid-range area of the market, let's say you've just bought your Xbox One X, you want the absolute pinnacle of HDR performance. Um, I guess, from my perspective, while well, I went for an OLED last year, LG B6, what are the options this year and what is your pick? Right, so uh, you've got sort of three OLEDs to choose from this year. You've got uh, one from Panasonic, which is uh, the EZ952, although uh, I must state that it's only available in the UK and Europe, not in the US. Uh, future generations that might change, but at the moment it's kind of a Eurocentric screen. 
You've also got the LG B7, and then there's the Sony A1. Mm -hmm. So I guess in terms of, sort of my picks, there'd be two of them. The LG B7, I guess I'll start with as kind of the best all-rounder for SDR and HDR. In terms of uh, what stands out with the LG B7, it's the way that it tone maps the HDR performance. So the brightness is only around 600 nits, but what the LG TV tends to do is try and resolve highlight detail to a much higher level. So if you have a game or a film that's got you know bright highlights up to 4,000 nits, it will try and show that, uh, rather than sort of just clipping it away. Mm -hmm. uh, the downside is the picture can appear a bit dimmer compared to sort of last year's B6. So you're trading detail for uh, brightness, basically. Uh, and the other option is something called dynamic tone mapping. I think they call it dynamic contrast, but if you use that in one of the accurate picture modes like the ISF dark room or bright room, and you choose dynamic contrast on low, it has something called dynamic tone mapping. And to explain what it is, basically you've got two sort of HDR competing formats. HDR10 and Dolby Vision. And the difference between them is that HDR10 there's just static metadata. So whenever you have a Blu-ray or a game, it basically says this is the peak brightness, this is the sort of the black level. And then the tone mapping has to basically tone map the entire content, every scene, no matter what the actual ratios of light and dark are to those around those values. Whereas on Dolby Vision, this is done on a scene by scene basis. So for example, if you have like a scene where you're sort of walking through a cave with a torch and the torch is only 400 nits and your TV, say the LG B7 is only 600 nits, rather than trying to resolve details up to 4,000 nits, which don't exist in this scene, it tone maps so that you're getting those details that are lower at the correct brightness level. So okay. essentially the picture is not darker in terms of mid-tones, whereas a straight tone mapping algorithm won't know what to do with those scenes. It's kind of a general across the entire content. But if we push that back to gaming, mm -hmm. pretty much all the consoles, including Xbox One X, using HDR10. So does that technology help the output from Xbox One X? It does, yeah. I mean, it's basically designed as an alternative to Dolby Vision to kind of, if you want to have that highlight detail resolved in bright scenes, but you don't want darker scenes to sort of uh, appear darker than they should. So it basically just scans the HDR10 signal, analyzes it, and then basically makes a judgment on how to tone map each frame. Mm. So effectively, you're getting more out of HDR10 content while still getting the ability to have those uh, really detailed peak highlights in scenes that require that. So that's the LG B7, right? Yeah. Now there are other OLED alternatives, uh, but I believe they're all licensed from LG, but other manufacturers are kind of jumping on the bandwagon. Yeah, so they all use uh, LG panels. The differences are in how the, uh, the panels are driven via software and other sort of hardware tweaks. Uh, so even though they use the same panels, the picture quality is kind of similar, but there are sort of distinct sort of advantages and disadvantages depending on which TV. So in terms of like the Panasonic EZ952, uh, if you want sort of the most accurate colors in terms of HDR calibration, that TV delivers sort of better performance than the Sony A1 or the LG uh, B7. And it also has a kind of tone mapping algorithm that tries to uh, give you sort of really bright highlights but at the same time try and keep detail up to sort of those 4,000 nit levels. So it strikes a balance between what the LG OLED is doing, uh, whereas the Sony A1 is kind of a little bit different. It tries to give you the maximum peak brightness, but you lose detail above sort of 1,000 nits. But generally you would favor the B7? Yes, I would um, go for the B7 all round as you can sort of get it everywhere in the world. It has mm -hmm. low input lag uh, and it does a really good job with uh, HDR in general. So. I think uh, we should sort of stress that uh, we were talking about the 48 zones on the XE90. Mm. Now in terms of dimming on an OLED, every single pixel yeah. is individually capable of the entire range. All so, 8 million of them, yes. Yeah, so, so. so effectively you're looking at 8 million <laughs> zones yeah. as such. Okay, yeah, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I went for last year's model, the LG B6, because HDR is just on another level, really, compared to the mid-range, right? Exactly, yeah, and there are some content that can look almost as good in SDR as HDR because of that, those dimming zones or those individual pixels, you just get that pop with content, even if you're viewing SDR, which you don't really get on an LED LCD unless you're uh, feeding that HDR. So yeah, it's one big benefit of the OLED screens in general that no LCD will match, and that's the precision of the, the HDR and indeed SDR. 
performance. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to the absolute high end. And uh, let's just say you've got an infinite amount of money that you're going to be spending not on an OLED, but on an LCD. And that's pretty much one candidate there, isn't it? Really, yeah, isn't it? The, uh, the Sony ZD9 or Z9D, if that's what it's called in, in the US. And I think has about 650 zones. Okay. So it's got the biggest zone count of any LED LCD. So you get a much better precision than say the XC90. It won't rival an OLED obviously, but if you do want to have deeper black levels and maintain that HDR contrast uh, in mixed scenes, then that's the best LCD on the market to do that. Yeah, I mean, I've seen uh, the ZD9 and it is eye-searingly bright at its absolute peak. Yeah, it's like at 1800 nits. Right. So it is by far the brightest uh, HDR screen on the market. And with that kind of brightness, it doesn't have to worry so much about sort of tone mapping. It's got plenty of headroom to give you a good HDR experience. Okay, so let's stack up all of our recommendations and how much they cost. So let's go back to the mid-range. We had two recommendations there. The key pick was the Sony XE90, right? So how yes. much is that? Right, so that comes in uh, screen sizes between 49 to 65 inches and in pounds it will be £1,200 uh, for the 49 inch going up to £3,300 mm -hmm. for the 65 and in dollars about $1,000 for the 49 inch up to $3,000 mm -hmm. for the 65. Okay. But that is a pretty good price for the performance you're getting there. Yeah, definitely, especially mm -hmm. for the, uh, the lowest entry level. And the Samsung Q7F. Right, so uh, slightly more expensive here, uh, 49 to 75 inches, uh, £1,400 up to 4500 and then dollars, $1,600 up to $3,500. Mm -hmm. So these are our kind of uh, prices as we see them now, but Black Friday, who knows what's going to happen. Yeah. Keep an eye on those models though. Uh, okay, so let's move on to the OLEDs now. Right, so B7, uh, 55 to 65 inches. Uh, at the moment in the UK, you can get it for £1,700, going up to £2,700. Mm -hmm. And then US is 1600 up to 2600 so yeah, it's kind of ballpark what I paid for my B6. And I have to say, yes, it is a sizable leap from uh, the mid-range screens. I mean, you're adding like, what, 60%? Mm. But the quality increase, you pay for what you get. Definitely worth it, yeah. And it's uh, really uh, £1,700 for the entry level, really good price. And finally, let's venture into cloud cuckoo land and <laughs> consider the Sony ZD9. We are looking at a screen that starts at 65 inches. so it's not going to be cheap. No, uh, well for the UK I only got uh, three grand uh, for the 65 inches. Uh, I didn't see the 75 inches available, but in terms of US pricing, between 4,000 to a whopping $7,000. Wow. Okay, so Xbox One X though, 450 pounds, $500, big leap if you're going to be investing in a higher end screen, even in our mid-range screens, you know, we're looking at double the price of the console. Now there are a lot of much cheaper 4K screens and the prices Black Friday collapse dramatically. So let's talk about those screens because, you know, they're not fundamentally bad, are they? No, uh, in terms of delivering, you know, just a 4K image with great contrast performance, decent color accuracy, they're really good in terms of as a basic HD TV performance is excellent. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't really go wrong with them for that purpose. Mm -hmm. But when you look at HDR, there's a lot more to it. There's how the screen can sort of display peak highlights. Can it display dark details at the same time? Wider color gamuts. And you've got all these extra features. And unfortunately, at the moment, a lot of the advanced stuff or more advanced stuff isn't uh, coming down to the lower end TVs. So effectively, like we had the Samsung KU 6400. Uh, this year I think there's the MU6400 or MU7000 in America and basically for HDR on those screens you're looking at a very basic presentation so you don't have any dynamic backlight so you feed it HDR, backlight ramps up to maximum and it's kind of stuck there so if you have a dark scene you're looking at a washed out image that is I guess worse than SDR. Right. Uh, and there's things sort of 8-bit panels so you might get banding on HDR content and you may or may not get a wider colour gamut to some extent. So I guess uh, HDR is really 
hit or miss on those low end TVs and you're not really seeing it the way you're supposed to. So mm -hmm. it'll accept the signal, but whether or not you can call it HDR. Okay, so basically anything below our mid-range recommendation, you're looking at a very compromised HDR presentation. But on the plus side, I mean, you know, they are cheap. And even if you're not getting proper HDR, you are getting full 4K. Not good for HDR, but brilliant for just normal mm -hmm. 4K SDR. I mean, screens like the Samsung, I mean, you still get that astonishingly low input lag. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. I think that's all we've got at the moment. Uh, thanks for that, Dave. Okay, good stuff. Well, please do like and subscribe to support everything we do here at Digital Foundry and follow us on Twitter for the latest updates. But that's all from us for now. Thanks for watching.